There's a pretty one, Ulysses. Hello, Booktube. I'm Sean the Book Maniac. Welcome back to my channel and another episode of Zooming In, which is a series on my channel where I engage with bookish social media luminaries the world over to discuss uh, bookish literary type articles online. And what a delight to welcome for her debut appearance on this series, but her second appearance on my channel, the wonderful Stella of the Booktube channel, 30 Books, joining us from Melbourne, Australia. Hello, Stella. Hello, Sean. You're very kind. Thank you very much. Uh, what do well, you call it? Social media luminary. Bookish social media luminary. Love that. That's great. Thank yeah, you. well, if, if, the shoe fit, <laughs> if the shoe fits, Stella, we are here to talk about a really interesting topic that was written about in an article on the uh, new website Reactor Mag. Every Book in the Right Time by Molly Templeton. It was published uh, in late January 2024, but apparently uh, was originally published about a year before that. And so the right book at the right time or the wrong book at the right time is a really interesting topic to delve into. Stella, what did you make of this article? Oh, look, I really loved it. And had you asked me probably to, oh, look, I, even 18 months ago or something, it wouldn't have occurred to me, but some time ago, maybe in the last year, I was talking to a writer friend and they have books everywhere and they're always buying books and they're posting books, you know, like, and I am not one of these people, like I haven't read 60 books in the last month as some people do. I said, how do you get all this, this reading in? And she said, I don't read them all at once. Like I'm now reading a book that I bought two years ago. She might read a book that she bought a week ago, but she said, I read the books when it is right for me. That had never occurred to me. I sort of had it in my head. And I think a lot of readers might do this, feel guilty about not reading books. I mean, like there's so many things in this world to feel guilty about. I don't think, not reading books should be one of them. Absolutely. So that so, resonated with me. And I think particularly in times when the world feels a bit bit much, there's particular books you do want to read and maybe you want to tap into that more. Maybe you want to read the hard books then. So you had this conversation with your writer friend and did it change the way you read or choose which books to read? It did. It well, yeah. it, it lessened that. It was like just because I bought because I, I'm not sentimental about books anymore. I'm happy to get them out of the door. You know, lack of space or something. And I thought I have given away books now that I have read and thought, well, I didn't read them in the last five years. I'm never going to read them. But that's not true now. But I'm going to let that go then. Another way to to think about this topic is it's basically mood reading isn't it yeah choosing yeah. the book in the moment depending on the mood you're in that day that week it might be a slightly different topic, but i think they overlap considerably and my reading is so structured based on long in advance planned buddy reads and there's annual readathons and so a lot of the reading that I do is planned in advance. I always try to leave some room in my weekly, monthly reading that I can just put something in there that doesn't, that just appeals to me in the moment. But I actually eventually see myself getting back to where that's the, the predominant way that I choose what to read. I remember back decades ago, when I wouldn't choose the next book until I had finished the current book. And then I would just wander through my apartment full of books and just see which book figuratively jumped off the shelf at me. And that would be the next one. But I don't have much room for that spontaneity these days. I was going to ask about that. So where does this sort of, I even wonder if it goes a little bit beyond mood, but we'll, talk, we'll call it yeah. mood. Where does that leave then somebody like YouTubers that want to talk about like the Women's Prize, the Booker Prize, 
but we're not even that but like new releases or what is trending where does that leave people if it's about mood reading like you just have Absolutely. to do it and how does that affect your reading of a book have we ever read a book that we didn't feel like reading at the time but did we then Absolutely. go love or did we Abs hate it Absolutely. And I think that's probably responsible for a large number of my bails, especially back in the day when I bailed left, right, and center. <laughs> it just wasn't yeah. the right time. We're now into late February. This is being recorded on February 22nd. And I have yet to bail on anything this year, which I'm shocked by. I got to get my mojo back, my bailing mojo back. What I really relate to in what you said is, and what your friend was talking about is, having a bunch of unread books, being surrounded by unread books, and not, just having a, a, a sense, a, an intuition of when is the right time to read them. Some of my best reads over the years have been books that had sat beckoning to me on my shelf. And then when the time was right, I read it years later, and it was a wonderful experience. So can you um, give any examples of that? I'm trying to think, will I ever attempt James Joyce's Ulysses again? Are we ever in the mood to read Ulysses? Well, I'm not going to ever be in the mood. I, that's one that I have no intention of ever trying. I've read some of his short stories and some of his earlier, less experimental work, but Ulysses, I just have no desire mm -hmm. to read it, which is another interesting topic, like books that we have no intention of reading. Books we have no yeah. intention of reading, but talk like we know what it's about. <laughs> that's that's right. for a topic. I belong to a book group. So yeah. again, that's a time when you, you might not feel like reading that book, but you do because you belong to part of the book group. Absolutely, and that's why I don't like book clubs. Oh, I love it. I couldn't do without my book group. But we talk about, I think we talk about the book for like a nanosecond and then, well, actually I shouldn't say that. Open we, the champagne. We have robust conversations. I don't like not being able to choose what I read. And now there's all kinds of other ways in which I'm, you know, what's the difference between being in a book group or having five buddy readers from around the world that I'm regularly at, there's still an element where it's not always my choice, but I think it's more adjacent to what I would choose if it's just be an, a book that's chosen with me and one friend, but in a bigger group, God, I resented having to read some pretty crappy books that I would not have chosen for myself. <laughs> you have to belong to the right book group. I think there's times, yeah, my book group, I think they're a bit more highbrow than I am. But, so I'm the queen of procrastination. Is mood reading just another form of procrastination? Should people like me just go, just read the book? Just get into no, it? I, th I think procrastination, I can understand applying the word procrastination to things like cleaning the toilet or dusting out the cupboard, but not to reading a particular book because... It's a free country, and if you're reading for pleasure, you read what you damn well want to in the moment. You're not very good at procrastination, are you? My procrastination <laughs> covers the whole gamut. I'm just good at enabling you, Stella, to, to read the way you want. <laughs> yes, that's right, and I do read the way I want. within. But, yeah, there are parameters around that book group and then YouTube. Yeah, there's a certain kind of reader out there that likes to read seasonally. So they like to read books in the autumn that are set in the autumn, and they like to read Christmas books at Christmas uh, and so on. Are well, you I like know what your opinion on that is. <laughs> I would probably avoid reading a, a book in the season it was set just so that nobody thought that I was a seasonal reader. Are you? No, I don't think so. That has actually never occurred to me. Of course, there are beach reads and holiday reads that I really want to get into. But I often think about, for me, a good dark read in holiday time because it kind of counteract, but it's also a bit of escapism as well. But I can't think so, like some Patricia Highsmith while you're out on holidays. Not a big book, kind of small books. Well, a bit of Shirley uh, Jackson. 
And what also the other thing is, because so I'm just going to pick up a book. So something that's going on at the moment is just happening. So I picked up this non, so I love, as much as I love fiction, I really love nonfiction. So there's a book called In Bad Faith and it's written by Desi Ehrlich and she grew up in the ultra-Orthodox Jewish kind of sect maybe and she's a Melbourne person and her and her two sisters brought uh, sexual assault charges against their high school principal a woman and then when they went to charge this woman or when the allegations came forward the high school principal in the dead of night went to Israel she was kind of shuffled off and she's come then she was brought back to go to court so this is her story, Dassie's story, and I really want to read it because it, it's it's only just come out, like the court case from last year. So for me, even though it's summer here and it's February, I want to read this now while it's kind of fresh. That is a great example of how things going on in the world can affect our reading choices absolutely yeah. and I, do some and of I that. followed that case a bit and I just think this young woman and her two sisters are absolutely remarkable so I wanted to read this yeah sounds fascinating can you think of an example of a book that you have not yet read where the reason is it just hasn't been the right time yet um Yes. Oh, great. <laughs> yeah. You've got a whole pile. That's wonderful. I've got a whole pile. They've probably got a similar, like they're feminist books. Now, one is nonfiction, Jacinta Parsons, who's well known here, especially in Melbourne, because she was on local radio and she oh. is an amazing writer. And she wrote a book, Jacinta Parsons, A Question of Age, Women Aging and the Forever Self. I love Jacinta. This is a topic that really interests me, but I'm kind of scared about, I'm not ready to read it because, and it might not be a time thing. I don't think I'm ready for the kind of anger or outrage I might feel. And I I sort of, there's a part of me that go, I, I don't want to know. I'm not, I'm not ready. Like, is that a head in the sand type of thing? Well, no, I think that if you're anticipating that a book is going to uh, bring up a whole bunch of emotions and anger and, and political high dudgeon, yep. choosing the right time for it is very I appropriate. I, I said, yeah, I might read it and go around punching people. That's what, <laughs> that's what I... Well, but Stella, <laughs> I thought you were going to say you weren't ready to read it. You have, you're going to wait to read that book until you're old because you're so young now. No, pipe down. So she does talk about it because she's in her 40s and she does talk about that some women said, well, why are you writing this book? Because you're so young. And she addresses that as well because then that's a bias of age. Look, Jacinta Parsons can do no wrong. And a friend of mine who's a journo, and a rabid feminist said, this is a really important book. Well, I haven't read it. And then the other book that I haven't read, it was given to me in October, Prima Facie by Susan Miller. Are you familiar with the term Prima Facie? Yes, but I, I never can retain what it means. I never no. remember what it means. It's certainly familiar. Oh, it's, on the face think, of it? On the face of it? Oh, I'm glad you told that me that it, because when no, I'm given... just, I'm, I'm wondering, I'm not sure. Shall we I think it it's a law court term because when my Definitely. friend gave it to me, I think she thought I would have a reaction, but I was like, oh, I don't know what that means. But again, it's, it's fiction and it is based on a true story. I think it was in the UK and this particular woman changed a law, I think. It actually says here, Tessa finds herself in a position countless women, one in three, have been in before her. And will she take the stand to testify about her rape? Uh, drawn from the internationally acclaimed play, I beg your pardon, it's a propulsive raw look at the price victims pay for speaking out 
and the system that sets up to fail. Am I ready to read this? I did look it up. So prima facie means based on your first impression, accepted as correct until proven otherwise. So yeah, on the face of it. Right. But, you know, I think women are proven guilty until the Someone else is Absolute, proven guilty. Ab absolutely. <laughs> well, I can't yeah. wait until you read it and you uh, film a, Public a, oh, a, a, a video full <laughs> of your justifiable outrage. Have you read Ali Smith? She's a Scottish, a British writer, Ali Smith. I know the name. And she put out a seasonal quartet, four books. The first one, I think, was Autumn and then Winter and then Spring and then Summer. And I read Autumn and I loved it. And I read the second one winter and i wasn't so sure about it because they were very much written in the moment of brexit and i just thought you know what i want to read these in about 10 years whatever i don't want to be read it so immediately a work of fiction maybe she needed to write it and maybe obviously many a reader appreciated reading it so close to the political setting of it but i decided no i'm them on the shelf i collected them all yeah sometimes i want distance don't Leave. they say that about what makes a joke his, history plus plus time history like plus you have time. to have that distance like COVID. would you read a would you have read a, co a book about you know set during the pandemic or the crisis of the pandemic during in the middle of 2020 or even last year a lot of readers I, I'm aware of still think it's too soon to be reading COVID fiction. I read the, the only one of the only ones I've read was I believe I read it last year, maybe early last year, and that's Louise Erdrich's The Sentence. COVID is a big part of that story, and I loved it. And it, it was about a year, year and a half after COVID, so it was the right time for me. But I know many readers say, no, 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 too soon, too soon. Yeah, what if it's, I was watching a show, comedy series last night, it's quite a few years old, and we're into the final season, and it's COVID, like they've got their masks on, and, but it's comedy, and I think, is it, is it something about serious books that we need the time, or can we read funny books anytime? The same with a funny right. show. Does yeah, that make it palatable? It's a fascinating topic. And I know lots of readers who, when their life is heavy, they don't want to read anything heavy. And I'm going yeah. through a heavy thing going on in my personal life right now, but I'm still wanting to read heavy stuff. I still occasionally read lighter stuff, whether it's Barbara Pym or something that's more comedic. But for the most part, I want the dark literary... Um... Yeah. Wow, Barbara is a great comfort read, I find, and just like, I just, when I read Barbara Pym, I think I want to move to a village full of vicars and spinsters. And and hot curates. <laughs> and hot curates. So have you heard of a, a writer called, I feel like it's Barbara Pym on steroids, her oh. first surname. She was the first woman to win the Booker and the second person to win the Booker. But Bernice Rubens. Yes. And what no, was I that haven't. book? You can find out here. Um, the Elected Member yes. was her book. And there's another book that I read of hers, The Elected Member. And the one that was made into a movie, which I have seen, is Madame Suzatska. Oh, yeah. And wasn't Shirley MacLaine? Yes, she was. Absolutely. What did I read of hers? A five-year sentence. That's what I read. So in those books, talking about Barbara Pym, you, especially a five-year sentence, I opened it up and thought, I know where this book is going. This is going to be a Barbara Pym. She, this woman, I think it's like she's got enough money to live on for five years. I think she's been looking after her. She's been stuck in a house somewhere or something like that. It absolutely did not go the way I expected. Oh. It was very, very 
dark and I wondered sometimes, is this book cruel? But it wasn't. I imagine an evil Barbara Pym. <laughs> now, I just heard somebody in a comment on one of my videos say that they were incensed that in a Bernice Rubin's novel, she treated rape rather comedically and mm, yeah anyway, well she wouldn't that. be alone because there was also well yeah that's right I wonder what book that was I don't want to be an apologist but I think even at the time maybe people were distaste by that look I could name a, a hundred movies like there was a Pedro, Pedro El Motivar movie there's a movie called Kicker I don't know that one of his but yeah Treats it so, hilariously. Well, I think that talking about when is the right time and when is the wrong time to read certain books is a really fascinating discussion. I think we've just only delved down a little bit deeper than the tip of the iceberg. We could probably talk for another hour, but I, I'll tell you, Stella, this conversation has certainly happened at the right time for me. So thank oh. you so much. Thank you, Sean. Thank you so much. And thanks for everything you do and the way you, I hate saying reach out. It's become such a, we use it in the office all the time, reach out to them. I think, oh, no, email. But you did, you do reach out to people and invite people on. Thank you so much. Well, I'm going to be reaching out again, so I hope you'll come back. I will indeed.